Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Okay, well, I believe I have the word of the Lord, without a doubt. Um, and I'm probably not going to talk <clears throat> much about Jesus or anything like that. Do you believe that, we, that where there is truth, we can embrace it wherever? Do you believe that? Because it <clears throat> sometimes concerns me that it's like, well, I know that we're not uh, conventional in that sense, but many years back, everything had to have chapter and verse, and if you weren't preaching out of the Bible, then you weren't really bringing a message. But I actually think what we're going to do tonight is bring something that's quite powerful. It was very powerful for me uh, when I saw it. Now, we have a 10-minute little film I want to show you that's been edited, and we've done our best. You know what it's like when you're taking a 10 minutes out of a, a, an hour uh, film. To try and keep the thread, we had to be careful. But I want to show that uh, towards the end. But first, I just want to make some comments. Um, and I'd ask you not be on your phones, you know, unless, I mean, if you're taking notes, fine. But try and engage and listen, because I think you'll find that this, you're going to hear something good uh, tonight. Um, so we're going to find truth in, actually, the noble truths of Buddhism, would you believe? Ah! Ooh! I think we can, you know, we can find some wonderful truth there. Anyway, uh, we'll get to there in a, in a little while, but... First thing I wanted to say is that a few of us went to see The Shack uh, last uh, Sunday, and I don't want to give it away for those who might want to go and watch it, but I have to use some of it tonight just to establish uh, what I'm doing, because <clears throat> there's a point in the, the Shack where Mac, who is the central figure, uh, is invited to go back to the place of his worst nightmare. And for those who haven't seen it, it doesn't matter. I'll try and just, you know, give you the, the bare bones. And there, he actually meets with God, who he comes to know as Papa, who is actually a black woman, and just blows his socks off because it wasn't what he expected. And that's what's so wonderful about this film, because everything you thought you had buttoned down is not quite as buttoned down. And it's wonderful. It's what we like, isn't it? Anyway, and then he angrily asks... Why did you bring me here? And she says the most incredible couple of words. She says, because this is where you got stuck. Powerful. Now, most of us don't want to ever admit to being stuck. But I'll tell you what, I'm quite willing to put my hand up because I can see probably every day in my life little points where I think, I'm stuck because it keeps, re it keeps coming round and I keep seeing it and I think, I've got to admit that I'm stuck and I need to be taken to that place where I can undo that stuckness. I, I like my, my English language, it's great, isn't it? So, I listen to people constantly and I'm going to try and keep to my notes because then we can have the 10 minute film without me digressing. Is that okay? So I'm trying to do, so if I'm stuck here, it's because I'm not following rabbit trails, I'm just going to stick. Is that alright? Okay. So, right, I listen to people constantly, and often as they tell me their struggles, you always find that their struggle in the present is related to being stuck in the past. Isn't that right? Are you with me? What you're going on now is usually related to something in the past. Whether it now here, this is where it gets a bit weird, because it doesn't matter whether your experience that you're feeling is bad or good. It's usually related to the past. Some of you think the only time you get stuck is when you've had a bad experience in the past. You can be as stuck because of a great experience in your past. Because nostalgia is just as crippling as post-traumatic stress disorder over a, a war in Iraq or whatever. Are you, are you getting me? Sorry, <laughs> that, that threw me a little bit. I shouldn't have mentioned Iraq. Shouldn't have mentioned the war, should I? Okay, right. So anyway, some of you, it's not so much what's happened to you, but what someone did to someone else. 
that's got you stuck. Now think about that one. It's not what's happened to you, but something happened to one of your friends. And since it's happened to your friends, you're mad at the one who did it to them. So you're stuck because of something that happened to somebody else. Oh, put that in your pipe. And I'll tell you, you know how I know that? Because it's usually me who's done something to somebody and then everybody's mad at me because I did it to somebody else. I'm the scapegoat most of the time. Isn't that true? Oh, don't want to admit it. Okay, never mind. That's where I can be stuck. Because I can be stuck believing I'm the scapegoat. See? Anyway, so I want to say this. Remember that yesterday is not your present It's your past. Because often we think that what we're going through this week is our present. But actually, if it happened yesterday, it's still your past. And if you choose to bring it in today, that's your problem. But in fact, it's your past. Right now, in this moment, nothing untoward is happening to you. Isn't that amazing? Just think about it for one second. You're safe. Nobody's after you. The bank doesn't know where you are (laughs) or or the person who who has hurt you all your life until I said something you'd forgotten about them but are you getting me you're right you're safe right now and often when, when we talk about living in the moment if you would only live in this moment all of time you'd realize there's nothing to worry about but we never live in the moment because we're always bringing the past into the present You get me. I've got to keep going because we've got a 10-minute film and keep reminding me. Okay, so coping mechanisms. So we create them to protect us. We either withdraw or we become very controlling. I'm going to watch everything. I'm going to sort it out, make sure nobody does it to me before I do it to them. Yeah? Or we withdraw. Not coming out of the house because I'm unworthy. Right. Because we're stuck and we suffer because of it. Now, another word for being stuck is the word attached, which comes, now listen to this, from the French word attaché. Oh, aren't I clever? I'm brilliant, aren't I? Which means to be nailed to. Oh, it gets a bit more serious when you think that. Attached means nailed to. And some of you are nailed to events in your past as violently as Jesus was nailed to the cross. Think about that. You ain't getting down, you're stuck there. That's how bad, right? A past experience dominates our present. We're nailed to it, attached to it, but that's not all. From those experiences, we've created meanings. Oh, and guess what? We don't relive the experience, but something else totally different happens. But guess what? It triggers the same meaning as we had of the incident 40 years ago. Oh, it must be right. Does it make sense? So meanings. I had a situation yesterday. It was so interesting. The phone rings. It was so-and-so. And what it meant in the past meant the same in the present But it didn't mean the same. The person on the phone didn't want the same as that it would have wanted 20 years ago. But are you following me? Still meant for me. Oh, oh, oh. Do you get it? Triggering. The anxiety rises because it meant something and we still give it that same meaning. See, I think that it's good to talk about stuff that matters. Are we talking about stuff that matters? Do you want healing? Do you want unnailing? I do, I'll tell you. Okay, so next, physical manifestations of inner conflict. See, we don't understand that sometimes we are suffering physically for the things that we nailed to in our psyche for 40 years ago. It's coming out in headaches. It's coming out in skin disorders. It's coming out in all sorts of stuff because the physical is screaming, I'm nailed. And we ain't going to be healed in the physical until we deal with stuff in our minds. We want wholeness. And I'm only trying to point way to wholeness tonight. So we would rather have a pill than do work of inner transformation. Who wants to go to the shack, to a place of incredible horror 
if that's where I'm going to find my healing, tell you what, we better go, aren't we? Anyway, we suffer because we cling either to what was an image, sorry, of what was or an image of what we think should be. And that becomes why we suffer. Now, this is where I'm bringing the Buddhist thing in because it's, I love the fact that all over the place there is truth that we can embrace. There are four basic noble truths of Buddhism. I'm not a Buddhist, but I think I could become one. But anyway, um, but I agree definitely with these four noble truths. And listen to this. Suffering is a fact of life. Suffering is caused by attachments. Liberation from suffering and the reinstitution of human freedom can happen only through detachment. That's common sense, isn't it? And the last one, human effort towards detachment must involve all aspects of one's life in a spiritual way. Now, spiritual, what I mean is with integrity, not separating, compartmentalizing, this is spiritual, but that is, you know what I mean? Secular. I know we don't use much in, in the church, but many people separate their life in a spiritual way, in a wholesome way, looking at it all, right? So I'm not here to teach about Buddhism, but we can le learn something from this, a lesson from what's called the sand mandala. And it's amazing in the sense of what the, the lesson is. When, whenever the, the Dalai Lama goes anywhere, he, usually speaking, whether it's in another country or whatever, those of the same faith, they gather and they prepare something which is called a sand mandala. And basically, it's, a, it's an incredible creation of sand. And um, it's a picture of the universe as they see it. An imaginary palace a sacred mansion of which they call life. Just the whole of life is actually depicted in this sand picture. It's perfect symmetry, it's balanced, and it's said to transmit this energy of healing, enlightenment, purification to those who have a look at it. Because why? They believe that their God is in that and is transmitting something incredible. I mean, I love this. I think, wow. What an awesome thing. But I mean, it gets a bit difficult if you've got 700 gods and you've got to incorporate 700 gods in a circle, bits of sand. I mean, that must be, woo. And they use these little, like, tubes of metal and they're tapping it, tapping it. And little tiny grains of sand in different colours are dropping very, very slowly in precise way, so intricately. It's unbelievable. But you see, it's not just the creation of it that's important. It's the destroying of it too, which is even more important because all the work that goes into making it out of these millions of grace, grains of sand, it's just as important that when they're finished, it's all wiped away. Now, let me first say, if a mistake happens, I love this. If a mistake happens, all the monk does is put the little tube to his mouth and he sucks up the grains of sand. I know that sounds awful. Just think about it, though. That are in the wrong place. Nobody even knows that a mistake has been made. Don't you find that incredible? In, in a world where we're always wanting to point out people's mistakes, that all that happens is... I thought that gives a new meaning to suck it up, doesn't it? Well, doesn't it? Suck it up. I used to think sucking up means, oh, just put up with it. I'm thinking now, no, do you know what? I'm going to suck that up. That mistake's going to be gone just like that. Oh, do you like that? All of you who are hard on yourself every time you make a mistake, think, Chris said, suck it up. Gone. Oh, isn't that lovely? I love it. Anyway, moving on. But here's the thing. When it's completed... As soon as it's completed, it doesn't even get the opportunity to stand in a room and be admired by visitors who come past it and have a right good look at it and admire it and say, oh, fantastic. As soon as it's completed, that's the point where it has to be destroyed. And one monk will come and he will literally, with a tool, draw a line through it. Oh, and I mean, we're talking about incredible intricacy and work that's taken sometimes up to six days to complete. 
He draws the line through it and then starts to stir the middle. And then he invites the other monks to come and they either use their hands or a brush and they just mix it all by pushing it from its edges into the middle. And all you're left with is this incredible mass of nothing where there was once this incredible colour and, and picture and meaning and all this. Suddenly, it's gone in an instant. And what's that about? It's to tell them that life is not permanent. Now, you might say, whoa, why, why has Chris brought me here to this spot? Because our attachments are because we want everything to be permanent. We, we're mourning all the time stuff that we should have just wiped away. But instead we're saying, I don't want to wipe it away. I want to remember it. I want to keep it. I want to stay nailed to it because it meant something to me. It's making you suffer. It might be beautiful, but it's killing you. So they come and they wipe it to the middle of the table. Then they gather it all and you know what they do? They go to a nearest stream and they pour the sand in the stream so it can be carried as continual healing to the world. Oh, isn't that nice? Beautiful. It is. Okay. So, what does it mean? To the Buddhist, the destruction is a sign that practicing this non-attachment is essential to life. Now, non-attachment does not mean the absence of love and appreciation, but rather the acknowledgement and acceptance of the fact that we cannot cling to things in an ever-changing universe. Now, if we'd only learn that, wouldn't we feel much better? Because we nailed to so much stuff. And it's 34. We're doing all right. Okay. Is this all right, though? Is it helping? I hope so. Everything is best, according to the Buddhists, when appreciated in the moment, not the past, not the future, but now. Listen to this. It's, it's wonderful. All things are in flux. What a word, flux. It reminds me of like a de detergent. Was there something like a flux at one point? I don't know. I seem to think flux, washing detergent. <laughs> Or do you look at paint? That's what it is. I don't know. Anyway, listen to this. All things are in flux. That means continuous change. It's beautiful, but it's ephemeral, which means fleeting. It's passing. It's moving, but it's temporary. It's a plateau, but not a summit. All things are called to balance and enlightenment of the divine image in them. Yes, but flux always Always flux. I love that word flux. I think I'm going to adopt flux. Could call a cat flux, flux, couldn't we? Sounds a bit cat name. Anyway, okay. It's a bit like the word transition, isn't it? Think about it. Constantly changing. So here's the question that comes out of all this. What are we going to make permanent? What should be permanent and what should be flux? I like that. I reckon that if we were to ask the question in our lives, what do we have in our life that we demand or we fight to keep us permanent? What then? Yeah, getting to that. Love's coming. But most things that we keep as permanent are the things that we should brush away. And the things that we should keep as permanent, we usually discard, right? And I'm getting to the point in a little while where... The Bible does say that these three things remain. Because it gives Corinthians 13, it's talking about a whole bunch of stuff that's great and is lovely and wonderful. But it says, put that aside now, because these are the three things that remain. Faith, hope, and the greatest of these is love. So we know that faith, hope, and love is what we should put our permanence into, but not all the other stuff. And we're going to talk a little bit about what we hold as permanent. Now, once we want things to be permanent, we find that we fight. I don't mean fight fisticuffs, 
but we fight in our hearts. I talk to people all the time who have this inner turmoil going on. Why? Because they want something to be permanent that is temporary. I'll say, well, you just can't have that. Yes, but I want it. And I'll say, but you can't have it. It's a bit like Chris Chapman wants the weather to be sunny every single day. And Chris Chapman just can't have it. So she better just get used to it. Do you get my point? So it's no good me getting depressed, getting unhappy and not being able to come out of my house because it's raining. I have got to let it go. You're looking at me funny. Weather to me matters, I'll have you know. Thank you. Anyway, so listen to what we want to control. Our world. And when I say our world, yeah, we do want to control our world a bit politically and all that, but it's usually this, isn't it? Our world, our, you know, what we stand in, our friends, what they're doing, what they're saying, are they treating me right, are they this? We want to control that. Oh. Um... Our position, our status, privilege, our rightness, our certainty, image, our beliefs, our religion. We want them to be permanent. Guess what? They might not be. Or you might not be able to have them. Are you, are you with me? You may have got stuck, you see, because of the death of something or someone. You may be stuck because of a failed marriage, because of a failure of a job or a failure of some, some kind. You might have lost something. We also want to control our offences. But stuff happens to us and we realise we get offended because people do stuff to us. But we make them permanent. Our fear of loss is permanent. Our past is permanent. Our beliefs are permanent. permanent. Our offences, our anger, our abuse, our betrayal, our hurts, our pity. We make them permanent. They should be temporary. And love, faith, hope should be permanent. The moment we try to make these things that I've just mentioned there, and I've not done an exhaustive list, I've just tried to give you a a uh, 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 you know small but small number the moment we try to make these things permanent suffering will be inevitable so what we're going to do about it we're going to have to say right everything is transitory and i understand that these things only remain faith hope and love now that freaks some of you out because the idea of not clinging to what you have and what it has made you, how it has defined you in this moment. It's like, well, what will I be? Who will I be? But it equals suffering. And I say this about good things as well as bad things. If you're, if you're harping after some golden age, every day you wish you had that back, it's going to make you suffer. But anyway, we're going to show the video now I think and it might I, I hope that this is just going to um can I just say a few things before you put it on I have to just give you a little bit of background it's from the series called Madam Secretary if you watch it that's great it, it, you'll you'll get it easier but basically she's the Secretary of State for the United States and basically she's dealing with all the foreign affairs issues and there's basically two stories that we've put into this clip of two things running alongside each other. One is political and the other one is personal and it's how both of them are clinging on to something which ultimately is going to cause them great suffering if they're not willing to let it go. So the, the secretary is basically trying to create a deal with uh, India and China and Tibet and uh, basically China won't agree because they're not happy with the Tibetans and uh, she's trying to sort this thing out. And meanwhile, there's this two-year-old child in, uh, in the USA who they think is the new Dalai Lama and so China's not going to accept that because, oh, it's all right, do going on. And then the other story is about this failing marriage and this little other two-year-old, which is this other story, where the wife offers the guy a, a, you know, a custody deal uh, about the child and he's clinging 
uh, to a desire for the life that he's always known because this he just doesn't want and he realizes that clinging is not the answer. So if you want to put that on now, and then I'll just have two minutes at the end just to wrap this up. Um, but I hope you enjoy this. I'm sorry it's long, but we couldn't make it any shorter. So just enjoy this, okay? For me, you couldn't separate those grains of sand. You're not going to be able to separate the blue from the green and the yellow in order to put it back to say, this is the memory or this is the pain. This was the brokenness. This was, it's, you get me? That's why it's powerful. So this is what I believe my application of this is. I believe symbolically we each have a sand mandala that we've created of our lives up to this point that contains thousands of grains of sand that represents us, our internal map of our upbringing, our experiences, our beliefs, our visions, our fears, our joys, contains the good, contains the bad, and it's become precious to us because it's who we are. And anything that's taken that much time to put together, no one tends to want. Because even though it contains bits that we don't like, we like the whole because it's ours. It's uniquely me. You get it? But that's why we have to keep, unfortunately, the pain with it and the suffering. So are you willing to draw a line through it, run your hands through the sand, losing sight of the individual definitions that you have clung to and start again to live in the moment, the now. If you think about it, once you've got rid of that one, you maybe do an individual one each day. And then when you go to bed at night, you do the same. Can you see? Everything that's happened that's tried to, to attach you, you can say no. It's going. Something that happened on Wednesday night when we listened to Paul Scanlon, it was interesting because he reminded me of this when he talked about, somebody said to him, uh, you are ruining something. You're ruining the church uh, in order to have whatever was going to come or was going to be there. And uh, of course, everybody was unhappy that that's what he was doing. But the truth was, he said, no, this is right. We're willing to spoil in order that we might get something different. And you can't keep one thing intact if you want to let go of something in order to have something different. So the truth is he was willing to spoil it and stop clinging to what he up to that point held permanent in order that things could, could change. Now, he also said something else. He said, he pointed to David. He said, I used to be a shepherd, but now I am. And he said something else. And I thought, yeah, but we start the problem again. Because the moment I say, I am a giant killer, I've become attached. Are you with me? We should be saying just, I am. And I thought, how wonderful, because that's why God called himself. That's why his name was, I am. Because it meant that in the moment, he was going to be defined, not by anything other than, than the moment. So... Um, I wondered if people like things, and I don't want to be twee, but what I did is I ran off some mandalas, some pictures. They're only very simple. But if what I've said tonight has sort of resonated with you, I just did a little picture. It's only very simple. I didn't want to make it too in intricate or whatever. But if you want to take it home, and I don't want you to just to scribble, I want you to intricately colour it in and as you're colouring in, actually say to the Lord, say, show me my life and what I am attached to. And then when you've finished it and you're beautiful and you've look at it, then get rid of it. Tear it up, burn it or something. Don't just scribble because that won't mean anything. I'm talking about really allow. I mean, we were talking just before the surface service about somebody who's really pained because of, of a belief system that they've carried all their life. Tell you what, as I would, as it, as I would be colouring this, I'd be allowing the nails to come out of my hands that had put me to, the, to a cross of religious belief that had crippled me and kept me bound. Do you see what I'm saying? And saying, I, I, I allow this to be, to, to, 
to heal me, to bring healing for me. Now, you might think that that's a bit new agey, but some people like something to do as a symbol that they're actually getting with the, with the, 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 the uh, process. So let me finish by saying this. Commit to letting go, to actually saying, I will not cling to anymore. Actually see that there is something better ahead if we stop clinging. And um, as we think of what happened at the beginning when I said about the shack, that we are willing to go to those places which held the worst nightmares of our life and we're actually saying, Lord, will you unpermanent these for me? Unpermanent them. I like my words. They, they mean more to me than anything because they mean something. See, unpermanent them. And when you've done it, let it go. Now, just two scriptures. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. The church has put great emphasis on, a, on salvation being a one-time event where we somehow give our lives to Jesus. Do you know what? In this moment, in this now, you need to be saved. You need salvation because you need to be saved from the nails that are holding you to your past and you need to be set free and you need a salvation moment. And so now, now is the time. Now is the time. Now, one last, uh, something that I don't want anybody to think I have said, that somehow it is an excuse to be irresponsible and walk away from things that, like, for instance, somebody say, oh, they might think that you're saying just walk away from anything and don't be responsible. Of course I'm not. Remember what I said, these things remain. Faith, hope, and love. And that's what dictates, isn't it, our, our journey. So... It's a sign that we're going to not be nailed to that stuff. Yeah? Anybody up for it? I know I am. I know that I've spent the last 13 years, in, in essence, running my hands through a massive mandala that was, that was created over 40 odd years. And I'll tell you what, it was wonderful. And I still see little signs of me triggering back. And I have to say, no. We're messing that, we're messing it up good and proper. And it's going into, we used to sing a song, in the sea of God's forgetfulness, we put our stuff. Very jargony. But think of it in the terms of that river that you throw it in that's carried it away. God's memory is like that. And he wants you to forget stuff just as he does because you loved so I'm done. I hope that's been helpful. If you want one of these, please don't think it's a sort of a, a silly idea because some people will actually, if they commit to it, find some healing in it. So I bless you in the name of Jesus and I want you all to be healed. Yeah? Up for healing? All right. Anne, do you want to say anything? Nope. He's done. Right, we're done. See you Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all The Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk Then why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.